Good morning and welcome to the Vermont House Natural Resources, Fish and Wildlife Committee. This morning, we are going to be considering S-148, a natural duty to environmental justice in Vermont. We have with us Jennifer Byrne, environmental justice fellow at the Vermont Law School. Welcome, Ms. Byrne. Thank you so much. Good morning. Morning. Shall I begin? Yes. Okay. Good morning. I am very honored to be here today introducing an act relating to environmental justice in Vermont. My name is Jennifer Byrne. I am an environmental master's fellow in the environmental justice clinic at Vermont Law School. And today I'm here representing the Rejoice Project. I will be starting things off today by providing you with some history of the groundwork that went into developing this bill, and we'll highlight a few key components of the bill's connection to the deep community engagement work being undertaken by many people uh, throughout Vermont. This bill represents the input and expertise of many individuals across the state, and we worked hard in the Senate committee alongside advocates and agencies to reach these agreements and compromises. We fully support this policy and we're satisfied with the current bill as a first step to developing a framework on how to increase environmental justice throughout Vermont. Environmental justice is a term that until recently was seldom used here in Vermont. The demographics and rural setting of this state can hide environmental injustices in our communities and yet issues of water quality, indoor air quality, energy affordability, transportation access, food insecurity and associated health risks still disproportionately affect low-income and BIPOC individuals in the state. Community-focused groups across Vermont have been organizing for five years to inform the creation of this bill. We believe the environmental movement should be led by the communities who have the most at stake. We support and rely on community knowledge and expertise to co-construct interventions, policies, and transformative approaches towards building sustainable, just, and resilient futures for overburdened and underserved communities in Vermont. We know by studying the history of the environmental justice movement in our country, that the act of ensuring meaningful involvement of all people means actually building processes to enhance public participation in decision-making. We also know that in rural areas, environmental and health impacts may affect one small community far greater than a community just one valley over. We seek to identify how environmental, health, housing, transportation, energy, and food policies overly burden low-income and BIPOC populations and to eliminate structural barriers to entry in public decision-making processes. Over the past five years, we have heard directly from overburdened and underserved communities to identify shared experiences of un unseen environmental injustices in Vermont, all pointing to the need for the fundamental procedural justice protections this bill is seeking to establish. I'm going to share a few slides. And I would now like to introduce you to the Rejoice Project. Rejoice is a collective of academics, activists, nonprofit leaders, and community partners. Rejoice is an acronym, which stands for Rural Environmental Justice Opportunities Informed by Community Expertise. Our fund fundamental purpose is to craft environmental justice policies for Vermont based on the testimony of those who have been systematically excluded from the mainstream environmental movement. We strive to deepen the democratic process by creating a space for BIPOC, working class, and digitally underserved Vermonters to speak out for statewide change that centers the most impacted communities. Rejoice Partners included representatives from Center for Whole Communities, Community Action Work, CVOEO's Mobile Home Program, the Environmental Justice Clinic at Vermont Law School, and University of Vermont's Rubenstein School for, of Environment and Natural Resources. We have expanded our network and partnerships to include other groups and individuals, which I will touch on shortly. Over the past five years, 
Rejoice, the Rejoice Project has been conducting surveys, interviews, and focus groups around the state, forming connections in Vermont's most isolated and underserved communities in order to inform iterative community-led policy in Vermont. This is an example of a word cloud that was generated from one of our first community meetings um, before the pandemic that we held in Newport. In the months before the pandemic, Rejoice began implementing deep relational methods for community engagement, working with and compensating community liaisons to co-design and facilitate meetings, paying stipends and providing food and childcare to participants of community conversations, working with interpreters and hosting fully accessible meetings as appropriate, and inviting agency partners to attend as witnesses to the meeting. During the pandemic, Rejoice continued to engage communities, extending these practices to an online context. In the summer of 2020, Rejoice held 17 con virtual conversations with 77 participants from digitally underserved communities across Vermont. We drew on established relationships to hold focus groups with members of the Bhutanese Nepali, Somali Bantu, migrant farm worker, senior, rural, deaf, and hard of hearing, disabled, and mobile home communities. Our aim was to produce evidence-based accounts of environmental justice in Vermont. The driving questions behind our work were, what are the key environmental and health issues of concern to frontline communities? How do ethnoculturally diverse and low-income communities identify, prioritize, and integrate health and ecological concerns? What are the challenges to access, inclusion, and participation in state environmental and land use policy? How do these challenges contribute to existing environmental health issues? And what factors contribute to structural racism in Vermont and thus contribute to environmental justice issues? In our pandemic era focus groups, we asked questions about access to information and resources relating to the pandemic and challenges to accessing healthy food, safe housing, transportation, healthcare, and environmental information and resources. Rejoice's commitment to valuing the time and expertise of affected community members is central to ensuring equity throughout this type of community engagement. I'm going to take you to our website, um, environmentaljusticevt.org. So data from these conversations has been collected and analyzed by Rejoice in order to understand community health and environmental concerns, to understand how community members access information and participate in government systems and programs, and what barriers and gaps exist in current policies and procedures as experienced by Vermonters. I encourage you all to browse this database of community identified findings and recommendations relating to environment, health, food, housing, uh, transportation, economy, education, and equal access. It's very important to note that members of communities who had strong ties to service and advocacy groups or caseworkers uh, were less likely to express concern about lack of information because they had trusted sources of information and support. So I'm just going to click through a few of these. You can see here we have these detailed summaries by community. Um, and if you so select one of these, um, there are a few charts at the top um, as an overview of what was um, most prevalent in our conversation. And then as you scroll down, uh, you can see by topic um, what folks are talking about. Um, and there are plenty of quotes. Um, so this is really a great way. I, I think everyone would be interested in this um, to, as a way to hear from hear directly from Vermonters about um, what their experiences were throughout the pandemic. For our next phase of work, Rejoice Partners and members of the Vermont Renews Coalition are currently contracted to develop the Department of Environmental Conservation's Community Engagement Plan and recently received funding from the EPA to develop the Environmental Justice Network, which will serve as a bridge between communities and their government, improving communication between historically marginalized Vermonters and state decision makers while fairly compensating BIPOC and low-income residents for their lived experiences and expertise. Uh, 
I would like to turn now to S148 and give some very brief highlights of the bill. So for context, the Environmental Justice Clinic at Vermont Law School is engaged in a multi-year effort to document environmental justice laws and policies across all 50 US states and territories. This slide details the building blocks of EJ policy. We can say with confidence that this bill incorporates the basic fundamentals of effective EJ legislation and is a starting point for ensuring substantive procedural and distributive justice in environmental decision-making in Vermont. So what does S-148 or the Environmental Justice Bill do? Um, it sets an environmental justice policy that ensures that no segment of the population of the state should, because of its racial, cultural, or economic makeup, bear a disproportionate share of environmental benefits or burdens. It defines EJ populations based on low income, race, and limited English proficiency. It also provides definitions for environmental justice and meaningful participation. These definitions were developed through a participatory process led by the Vermont Renews BIPOC Council. It commits targeted spending in EJ populations uh, it sets a goal for the state to send, spend at least 55% of environmental renewable energy, climate, transportation, and resilience funds in designated EJ populations. It establishes an EJ advisory council and an interagency council. Uh, and the advisory council is comprised of community members from EJ populations. It commits the state to building an EJ mapping tool and this tool would be useful to communities and agencies to aid in information sharing and decision making. It establishes a date for compliance with Title VI of the Civil Rights Act so that all state agencies must develop community engagement plans. So I'd like to provide some legal context for the necessity of including the deadline for compliance with Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Title VI provides that no person in the United States shall on the ground of race, color, or national origin be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or otherwise be subjected to discrimination under any program or activity administered by a recipient of federal funds, including state agencies that receive funds. Discrimination in the environmental justice context can mean that communities of color and people with limited English proficiency bear disproportionate environmental and climate burdens or lack access to environmental benefits and climate solutions. It can also result in the exclusion from governmental decision making about these critical issues that impact our health and well being. One of the driving missions of the Environmental Justice Clinic's work at Vermont Law School is to enforce Title VI in the environmental context. You will note that in the legislation, we establish a deadline for all state agencies to move toward compliance with Title VI by developing and adopting plans to ensure meaningful community engagement. Um, these are also known as public participation plans. According to federal guidance, recipients of federal funds can demonstrate a commitment to Title VI compliance by establishing and implementing meaningful public participation and language access plans. To date, most Vermont agencies are grossly out of compliance with this law, resulting in public policy and decision-making that is not informed by the communities most affected by these policies and decisions. By enforcing civil rights law in this way, we are dedicating our state to incorporating key principles of environmental justice, including the fundamental right to political, economic, cultural, and environmental self-determination of all peoples, and the right to participate as equal partners at every level of decision-making, including needs assessment, planning, implementation, enforcement, and evaluation. Developing a clear public participation and community engagement strategy can be partially informed by census and geographic data as a starting point. However, in Vermont, as we have seen, the lingual, geographical, transportational, and technological barriers to participation are so varied 
data must be supplemented by the expertise of community members in order, in order to understand community experience needs and desires. I would now like to point out a few critically important budgeting considerations that advocates for this bill agree must be incorporated by the House in order to have the intended effect of equitably and meaningfully engaging overburdened community members. As we saw from the Climate Council process, without adequate funding or time for engagement with communities or for onboarding of council members, the most overburdened and underserved community voices will be silenced. And we as a state will fail to benefit from the expertise and vision of our most affected community members. We have provided this sample budget based on the work of Rejoice to account for per diems, training, and, uh, and facilitation of the advisory council members, um, as well as community engagement uh, in standing up the advisory council. While the fiscal note from JFO and the budget from Senate appropriations did not include any funding for this critical advisory council work, the fiscal note does point out precedent for paying certain councils members higher than the typical $50 per diem rate. We strongly recommend an amendment to this bill to include language that provides EJ advisory council members at least $200 per meeting to better account for the actual costs of preparing for and attending meetings and the personal costs of representing their community's lived experiences of environmental and health issues of concern. Additionally, this budget includes funding for engagement work in each county and each community represented on the EJ Advisory Council. This funding is intended to support the necessary engagement to recruit council members and to host community meetings in, to support and inform the council members as they perform their duties. The budget breakdown in column H is based on Rejoice's engagement model and includes stipends for participants, liaisons, and any necessary interpreters. This relatively small funding request is the critical bedrock that will allow for a successful rollout of this bill that will not be extractive of the very community members we seek to serve. We did submit this budget to the Senate committees and we hope that you will consider taking it up in the House. So in summation, we believe the environmental movement should be led by those who are most affected by the impacts of climate change and pollution, both as a matter of principle and also to ensure that any policies developed to address environmental and climate challenges will benefit from and incorporate the perspectives of people from all corners of the state. We believe in upholding community members as co-designers of environmental and climate policies and defend communities' rights to self-determination in decision-making. Community perspectives should be sought out, valued, and incorporated into policies and programs that affect community health and the environment. By doing so, we are confident that the results of this level of engagement will be stronger, more effective, and more resilient policies, programs, and communities. We're very grateful to you all for taking up this bill for consideration and hope that you will consider us as willing partners in the effort to create an equitable future for all Vermonters. Thank you very much for your time today. I look forward to engaging with you further and I'm available anytime for questions or further conversation. All right, thank you for your testimony. <clears throat> um, do members have questions for Ms. Byrne? Representative McCullough. Thank you so much for your work and, and your testimony here today. Our, our bill um, passed over from the Senate asks for 55% of state dollars to be invested in in the communities um our our our, our black communities could you could you um tell us what your expectation of that is what it what it means sure so to clarify um this would be 55 percent of environmental climate energy resources um, that we're asking to be invested into what's currently in the bill called um, EJ populations. Um, EJ population is defined by um, a population um, with 6% uh, or more of BIPOC 
um, one percent or more limited English proficiency, or um, there's um, I believe it's eighty percent. I'm going to pull up the bill. There's a, a low income standard as well. Um, so any of those criteria um, would designate a, 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 a census block group as an EJ population. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so the expectation would be that um, when, when we do that mapping, um, we actually see that the, within the um, currently defined uh, EJ population, that covers 52% of the state's population. Um, and so, we believe that you know uh, assigning 55% of the resources to these overburdened community members um, is reasonable. Um, it's also mimicking the Justice 40 initiative, um, and uh, so this is our attempt at at codifying that in in state law. I I thank you. I do understand, and I, I'm sure the committee does as well. The census block uh, concept and the need for dollars there, my real question is, is it your understanding that every water quality dollar, um, for instance, gets spent um, there, every transportation uh, dollar gets spent there, every, uh, every actual expenditure initiative from the various agencies get spent um, statutorily 55% of it in those districts, or or is it a different uh, uh, aspiration such as grant money? Um, you know, I, I think um, it's it's definitely something that we've been talking about with the agency. That's a, it's a very important question. It, a lot of it will um, align with and, and depend upon some of this mapping work. Um, and I and I do think that asking, I know you're, you'll be speaking with um, Ms. Gendron and Commissioner Wall later. I, I think that um, they would probably have a, a better for you on that. But um, but yes, we're we're not really defining this as a monetary resource, but but resources more broadly um, and services. Uh, so um, that that does need to be worked out. Um, and I and I think the agency folks are in a better position to to answer that question. Thank you. Any other questions? Representative Dolan. Good morning, and thank you for coming today. Um, a couple of things. <clears throat> One is that um, how we define overburdening. It would be really helpful when you mentioned that meeting those three criteria would result in identifying overburdened community was the statement you just said. And when I think of overburdening and I look at other examples around the country, such as New Jersey or Michigan uh, or, or California, uh, overburdening has um, is a term used to illustrate um, the environmental burdens that are disproportionately placed on a, a population, uh, which could be a census block. And that relates to, um, you know, uh, uh, exposure to uh, contamination or um, air water quality uh, degradation, that sort of thing. And uh, I'm, I'm struggling with predetermining what we mean by overburdening using these criteria. Can, can you help me out here in trying to better understand um, that term? Sure. We, in this version of the bill, we actually don't use that phrase um, overburdened um, or underserved. Um, and uh, the phrase that is used and defined right now in the bill is is EJ populate environmental justice populations. Um, we uh, and uh, the uh, something to know is that um, within the first year, the advisory council is tasked with looking at that definition and suggesting edits um, and additions to that population. So we're starting with these three criteria, which are 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 pretty standard and um, you know based on even you know our research within the state of Vermont, um, we understand that these populations are overburdened. Um, 
And so um, this, you know, this is a, a, we're a starting point for this definition. And, and I think you're right. We're, we're also not satisfied with this being the final definition, um, you know, for, forever, which is why in the bill, we're tasking the advisory council with, um, that's one of their first jobs is to look at the definition of EJ population and recommend if there are additional criteria that, that they want to see included. Um, I, hope, I hope that answers your question in a way. Yeah, that is, that is helpful. And tied to that is um, the, while I think your presentation has helped to identify other inequities that may be present, uh, such as, as you mentioned in your presentation, you described food security and housing and transportation and access to open space, which is something you haven't mentioned, but it's in the bill or perceived to be in the bill. Um, while when I look at other states and working on environmental justice, it has been focused on those um, hotspots of where we have cumulative environmental burdens relating to, as I mentioned, degraded air and water quality or um, um, you know, occupational or, or um, safety issues related to indoor air quality or asthma related, you know, from some of these impacts. So I'm, I'm struggling with the, the scope of the bill if we're looking at environmental justice um, as, as uh, a topic that other states have, have um, used in that context. Can you help me out in understanding the, the scope of this bill? Sure. Well, you know, because this is so new to Vermont, this is really a starting point. Um, and um, it, it's, uh, part of, it is identified, um, you use the word cumulative. Um, we do identify, um, you know, and set forth a, a rulemaking process in the bill to define cumulative environmental burdens. Um, this is really going to be reliant um, in, in a large part on the mapping tool. Um, as well as the, you know, advice and expertise of the EJ Advisory Council. Um, and so, you know, we don't want to set out and define that before the mapping tool is created. So um, that's why we, you know, um, are offering it in, in the rulemaking process over the first year um, or two. And so, uh, yes, so you're, you're right. And in other states, you know, you mentioned like hot spots in other states and, and that's really just not what we have here in Vermont in, in a lot of ways where we don't really have, you know, a, a, a obvious polluter um, in some communities, yes. But um, because, it, you know, it's, it's so widespread and it, it really comes down to access to information and, and resources um, that that is not, equal, um, depending on where you where you live, um, what language you speak, or the color of your skin. Um, and so that's where this bill is really a procedural bill in large part. Um, other states have gone farther, um, but this is where, you know, we believe we need to have this, this baseline procedural um, framework set up before we can really move into to doing um, and potentially mimicking what, what other states have done. That's that's all I really can say to that. Thank you again for joining us with your testimony this morning. Thank you very much. With that, um, we will go to Deputy Secretary uh, Gendron. Hi. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Commissioner Walker is going to join me today, but he had a family emergency this morning, and so he was not able to make it. So it's just me today. Um, good morning. For the record, my name is Deputy. Well, my name is Maggie Gendron. <laughs> I am the Deputy Secretary of the Agency of Natural Resources. <laughs> We're glad you've taken that on. <laughs> um, you're going to actually hear a lot of the same terms um, used today, and. I think uh, something that is helpful in the space of environmental justice, because it is really comprehensive and complex, is something I wanted to do is just, um, without diving into the bill, set the tone for where we've been and where we're going when it comes to environmental justice and how it intersects with the Agency of Natural Resources. Um, 
and I and I, I am familiar with the bill. I did not come prepared to do a section by section, but um, happy to answer any questions as I recognize them and any ones I don't remember, um, I will make sure I get back to you uh, promptly. So um, I'm not gonna read, I did, had a PowerPoint slide that I wasn't able to go through last time and I'm not gonna read word for word what's on the PowerPoint slides, but I thought I would just talk to you what are the important components and why we're talking about it. So in terms, sure. So members know the PowerPoint is on our webpage under Maggie Gendron. Yes. Um, so one of the, so there, there are two, there are two things, there are two, there's three components of what I want to talk about today. First is talking about environmental justice. The second is talking about the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and what uh, we, we refer to as Title VI of that act. And then talking about um, ANR's uh, commitment to the EPA to work towards an, uh, an environmental justice policy for our agency. So those are really the three components I wanted to talk to. So environmental justice, um, you have seen um, the definition uh, pretty regularly now. And so I think the two main components of environmental justice that are really important is that to the same degree, the populations as described have the same degree of protection from environmental and health ha hazards and have equal access to decision-making as a process. And that's really what a lot of people refer to as meaningful engagement. It's that shared decision-making, which is a shift in how we do it now, which is really a lot of what state agencies do is communicate to the public what we're going to do. And this shifts it so it's a more meaningful process in which you're pulling in the community and they will help you shape your decisions versus you having made a decision and communicate it out to the community. So that, that alone is a pretty big shift in terms of how state government agencies operate now. Um, and also, um, let me just make sure. And so um, an important component of environmental justice work is that an executive order in the Clinton administration was passed in 1994. Um, that directed every federal agency to make an achieving environmental justice part of their mission by addressing and identifying uh, how people are disproportionately or adversely impacted by health or environmental impacts. And so that's important because then the federal government said to every federal agency, you must incorporate environmental justice um, uh, as part of your mission. And every federal agency does uh, takes on that engagement in a little bit different of a way or, um, or supports uh, <clears throat> state agencies in a different way. And so at the Agency of Natural Resources, we have the Environmental Protection Agency that works directly with the Department of Environmental Conservation as their federal funder grantee support system. And so that's why... Um, I'm saying that so when I get later in, in the process of talking about specifically the EPA, why, why I'm doing that. Um, so an important uh, difference between Title VI and EJ is that um, Title VI is um, ensuring that recipients of federal funding are also ensuring that their programs and activities do not discriminate on the basis of race, color, or national origin, and this includes uh, limited English proficiency, and where EJ closes a gap is addresses low income as well. So they are, um, the, the, uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 is really a cornerstone of environmental justice work, because a lot of the same components of meaningful engagement and limited English proficiency, we like to say language access, are incorporated also into environmental justice. So they're very much tied together. And that's why you hear a lot of people refer to the Civil Rights Act and environmental justice kind of in the same breath, but they're, they're different, but they're important to each other. So, um, 
So that brings me to um, the EPA does um, regular reviews of state agencies and they enforce um, what their expectations are of us as a recipient of federal funding. And so two years ago, or three years ago, we had a review and then they submitted us feedback on where we needed to close certain gaps. And what you do regularly is you come to a performance partnership agreement, which we call PPA. And that's really, it, it includes quite a few components, but it's a space where you're creating an agreement with the EPA to say, we're gonna work towards doing better in these places that you've identified that we need to be better at. And so for us, one of those spaces was the, that the Agency of Natural Resources did not have a environmental justice policy in place. And we needed to close some gaps on compliance around Title VI, which is our non-discrimination. So that really deals with grievance procedures and investigations of those grievance procedures. So we are on a four-year journey and we're two years into that journey of both adopting an agency-wide environmental justice policy and putting in place some mechanisms to um, do better with our non-discrimination and Title VI compliance. So I'm gonna pause there just for a second. You want me to keep going? I feel like I'm saying a lot. Yeah, you're saying a lot. It's helpful. I think okay. we've heard, I mean, we've, so this is great. Um, but I want you to actually just restate the last sentence you just okay. said about, the, I think understanding this kind of interplay between Title VI and the environmental justice is, is, a, is important for me, I know. Yeah. And um, so can you just restate that <coughs> relationship? Just sure. what you just said, I think. So Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, Title VI in particular, requires that any recipient, even $1 of federal funding, has to ensure that the programs and activities that you offer the public do not discriminate on the basis of race, color, or national origin. And that includes language access. Where environmental justice closes a gap is environmental justice includes low income as part of that, so income in general. And so the, 19, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and especially the Title VI component of it, is, is, a, is a huge foundational building block of environmental justice. Because you are um, taking into consideration a bunch of demographic and social determinants that are focused on environmental and human health and the burdens and benefits that you receive because of that. And so, um, and another piece of Title VI that is really important is creating language access and meaningful engagement for the public participation. And that is also a cornerstone of environmental justice. So they really, really are our work on the Civil Rights Act as a country laid the groundwork for a lot of other really good work um, that's been happening for the last four years plus. Yeah, and then I guess the, what I was getting to was under this performance agreement, part of that performance agreement is telling a and to invite to adopt an environmental justice policy. Correct, yes. Representative Smith. Yeah, I, I'm having a hard time <laughs> getting my head around this whole, whole subject. Thing. It is really, it is actually very comprehensive and complex, so you're not alone. Well, I, I was wondering if in in the statements that you have for not discriminating against individuals, ha, have you ever been brought up uh, short on that? I mean, has there been any lawsuits or actions or uh, a disgruntled uh, person, you know, make a, a claim uh, against you? I, I, and how, how do you handle that? I mean, how, because you, you mentioned low income people, and I understand low income people are struggling with a whole host of issues just to put food on the table and eat their home. But have you ever, do, do you treat them differently with your permit process or anything? Is it still the same. I, I'm trying to understand 
how this piece comes together. Sure. So in terms of the actual Title VI and non-discrimination clause, um, you have to create a grievance procedure, investigative manual, et cetera, um, that you have in place at your agency to do, do both external and internal um, review of complaints that might come in if somebody says, I think I was dis discriminated against in this way and can, and can submit a complaint. And so that's different than us participating with, for example, if we know a new program is going to be in place that offers funding to Vermonters, where, where environmental justice comes into play is if you happen to know that there's funding available to a low income community, you will change the way you engage with the community so that either your um, communication is clear or different based on the needs of that population, or that if, let's say you're trying to decide what the mechanics are of, of a program and how you're gonna fund it is folding communities of, that are EJ populations into that decision-making process so that they are accidentally left out of participating in the benefits of that funding. So that's, that's the hard, that's a shift in how a lot of state agencies have typically done their work. And so that's why environmental justice matters and why it's hard work to do. Yeah, so in the example you just used, does that result in reverse discrimination? I don't, I don't think I can answer that. I don't know. Yeah. I, uh, <laughs> when I was working for USDA, I remember there was a, a, a case of discrimination in the South, and it was discrimination against uh, African American farmers. It was called the Pigford case, and I think it was Pigford versus. Whitman, who used to be the Secretary of Agriculture at the time. And uh, there was some huge settlements there, but I know one of the outcomes was, because, you know, just in casual conversations with my counterparts in other states, they said if an African-American came in to borrow money or sign up for one of the programs, they just they just signed them up without any qualification. So, you know, while this case was being settled. So I, I'm just wondering to me that created some uh, discrimination against uh, the rest of the farmers. So I, I'm just wondering how this all fits together and, and how this program might have prevented something like that from happening in the first place. Um. I don't think I can answer your question directly, but I think what I can say about environmental justice is that the core components of environmental justice are to support Vermonters in being a part of decision-making before decisions are made by the government so that you are taking into account things like minority populations, low income populations, and it's, and we don't do it well now as a state. So that's why environmental justice has, a, has, um, I think, gained a lot of support around the country, especially, you know, whether you have uh, climate crises, or you have <coughs> flooding events, or you have a pandemic, we're seeing more every time that we just are not doing a good job of taking care of um, certain parts of our populations. There is a undue burden and a undue benefit based on who you are. And so that's how environmental justice tries to make some changes there. By incorporating the principles into your government activity. Yeah, I know what the <clears throat> principle is. I'm okay. trying to understand how it's actually applied and I know it's changed yep. over the years. Yep. Uh, so I can I can so we don't have an environmental justice policy yet at the agency. So therefore we haven't put together 
a directive for each department of how it would look, but I can, I, um, without getting ahead of myself, <coughs> um, A, you need shared definitions, B, you need to put a policy in place, and then C, you need the right kinds of tools to be able to understand what your population looks like, whether it be a state or a community. And then you need to be able to put some directives in place to say, for example, we have three departments at a &R, we, and Fish and Wildlife is different than DEC, which is different than Forest Parks and Rec. And so what we would have to say is, um, when you are considering, uh, and I'm thinking of ARPA right now because it's such a relevant example. So if you have funding and probably new program, and you're going to um, issue that program through ANR, we would take into account our EJ policy as we build that program. And part of that EJ policy would be community engagement so that you're making better decisions. And it's a lot of, it's a lot of work and it takes more time. It's, it's the right way to put your energy into Vermont, Vermonters. Um, and it's- I'm okay for- Yeah, okay. Uh, just, uh, <laughs> I'm trying to get my head wrapped yep. around this whole subject. Yeah. Well, the bill, is more comprehensive than the scope in which I'm talking about that impacts ANR. So I think that's the challenge um, that we're all facing. Um, so the agreement that we have at <coughs> is to adopt an environmental justice policy and to um, continue our civil rights compliance. And so um, we've made some, some pretty big strides at ANR over the last even year that I've been here, which is we were able to hire an environmental justice and civil rights coordinator. And she has put into place um, some really important um, pieces of the puzzle that were missing for us, which is an investigation, an agency-wide investigation process and manual that's consistent with um, our ANR non-discrimination non grievance procedure. We have a draft limited English proficiency and plan that we're gonna be bringing into final stages this summer, hopefully completed by fall. Um, we, are, we are issuing training that's going to be regular and consistent for our staff so that people can have a better understanding of how this work is incorporated into their day to day. And then um, we've established liaisons in each department in our agency so that we can start to build out um, what our recommendations are gonna be for an EJ policy for the agency. And um, there was another document that was shared with you last week, which was, um, which was titled our environmental justice timeline. And this timeline is attached to the development of our EJ policy. And you heard um, Ms. Byrne talk to DEC engaged with Rejoice in a community engagement contract. And we're, the, that community engagement contract, the results of that will be finalized by this summer or next spring. And we're gonna incorporate what we find from that into our environmental justice policy, which we, want to have finalized by spring of 2024. And so what we learned from this community engagement contract that we're working on with Rejoice is gonna be really instrumental in understanding how we incorporate uh, a community engagement plan within our environmental justice policy. So how does your ongoing work kind of interface with this proposed legislation? Um, I think, I don't know yet. That's the part that I'm trying to wrap my head around too, is that we're gonna do this work anyway. We have to. Um, it's really important to our, our teams that we do it. Um, in terms of this legislation, this legislation, I, I believe that the goal of the legislation is to make 
environmental justice policy more consistent across state government. Um, with that said, like I said, we're on, we're on a four year journey and we're two years in. And, you know, I'm trying to think through where are some places that we can take the work that's already been done and share it. So I, I think it's really important we match the funding available with the scope of the work. And it is really important that we do um, have better lines of communication across state government and the, who would be stakeholders on the advisory council. Um, how we do that is a challenge. Um, so you'll hear, you know, without, I'm, I'm trying to uh, be respectful of your time too, but you know, you, you'll hear some pieces um, talked to like the mapping tool and community engagement and definitions. And I struggle with the resources available to do the work because it is intensive. I struggle with um, how we create these definitions together which is important while also creating a community engagement plan while also developing a mapping tool. Those three items alone are equally and independently as important and are going to take time, um, especially because state agencies are coming at environmental justice with a different lens. So we come at it from a pollution lens, um, whether it be air, water, hazardous waste, if you're V-trans, you might be coming at it with a lens of, if you're building a new highway, how are the emissions of the cars going to impact the neighborhoods? And are those neighborhoods low-income populations, minority populations, or indigenous peoples? And that is where their lens comes from, <coughs> justice. And then same with the Department of Health, like thinking of algae blooms. How are you communicating to the public properly if there's an algae bloom outbreak and you need to um, let people know they shouldn't be swimming? They're, they're gonna come at their community engagement around that with a different lens. So I think that's the, there's some, in a lot of ways, there's some foundational steps that need to happen before we get to the end result and I, and, and, and a lot of those foundational steps are, um, they include starting the conversation. And, uh, and I, so that's why I'm glad we're having this conversation in the legislature. I'm just not, I'm not sure how we, again, like I said, match what's available for resources from the state to getting some of this work done. Well, I guess that kind of gets to the, request for 10 staff right out of the gate to do this work um, seems a little mismatched to what the tasks outlined are. So that was the work that we, so that was um, in terms of how we created that analysis is taking the scope of the bill, which doesn't just include a, what I would explain as a, um, kind of like natural resources lens, but it's lots of different lenses. And most of the work was following, following, falling on the plate of the Agency of Natural Resources. And so our perspective there is you both need, just learning from the Global Warming Solutions Act, you need technical analysis, it's data heavy, you're building a mapping tool, people who are an analyzing data don't have the same skill set as staff who are developing community engagement plans and working with stakeholders on how to do that. Um, so there's there's just it's a human resource intensive body of work, and my experience over the past year at the agency is that if you don't focus your energy, it's so overwhelming that you it's you're almost paralyzed by making progress, and so both what it was great about the EPA review is it made us really hone in on what we need, where we needed to close our gaps. 
And then over the last two years, what we were able to do is even further focus what steps do we need to take first, second, third, and how do we get there over a period of time? And um, so how does the, the EPA review and then the work you're, uh, you're doing re related to that, did that bring in other agencies at all, or was it only ANR focused? It was just ANR focused. We do work um, in for, we, we work quite a bit with um, Department of Health and VTrans, um, but not necessarily on environmental justice, but we, a lot of like the health related initiatives, um, we do talk to each other, but it's not formalized. I think other members had questions. Representative Lombard. Um, thinking about the mapping tool um and the inputs that will be what has work begun on that is one question we have only done research on how other states have developed their mapping tools and the mapping tool will be a really important again when you talk about inclusive decision making the advisory council outlined in the bill would be responsible for creating expertise and advice on building the mapping tool as well and so and just be driven by agent by government so you're 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 then saying that that's a prerequisite for developing the mapping tool or well is it a prerequisite uh you can't build a mapping tool on a silo because especially this bill looking at food access transportation access health access with the decisions that need to be made in the mapping tool which other states have said really they struggled with is how do you layer your decisions like it's not just you're not just looking at low income uh, minority populations or indigenous peoples you're starting to look at where are the bus stops where are the grocery stores where are the floodplains where are the brownfield sites and then you, you kind of have to decide when to stop um and that's where that's where that conversation, um, I think, sometimes can take a lot of time because you have to get to a common ground. So I, I buy, and I understand you can't build a silo. That makes total, that makes sense. Um, are engaged now with Rejoice, right? We're working on a community engagement contract with them that's going to inform our environmental justice policy. Representative Lafayette. Thank you. Um, thank you for your testimony. Um, you know, it seems to me so much of the environmental injustice has been driven by economics. I mean, no one wants to live on back street. No one wants to live next to a, to a railroad yard. No one wants to live close to a factory. I don't, I'm having a hard time figuring out how this policy or guideline would prevent, would do anything to mitigate that or change it. If, Basically, people move where they have the money to live, and uh, I and I don't know how uh, this this policy will either increase their earning or 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 their standard. Well, I would I would encourage you to think of it this way. What environmental justice does is, for example, let's say you live, let's say you're a low income family and you live in a floodplain. When the state of Vermont starts looking at are we going to allow people to build in floodplains? Part of an environmental justice principle based in that is, hey, wait a second, a lot of low-income families live in floodplains. How do we support those families to find other places to live while simultaneously disallowing homes to be built in floodplains? So it's the, the work of environmental justice is to correct past injustices, and that's kind of the utopia and also prevent those from happening in the future. And so a lot of environmental justice work, you don't necessarily see immediate impacts right away. It's that shift over time where you start to bring, um, you shine light on decisions that are made by government agencies that, that may or may not be inclusive or comprehensive of actual thoughtful community engagement. Um, just one other follow-up. Uh, so environmental justice is basically looks to rectify or kind of overcome uh, situations which have been 
environmentally um, caused, and I, by that I mean by by living in a floodplain or by you know living in places that are environmentally sound. Uh, and yet, what if you take that con uh, concept and think of it as terms of um, the environment as a, as a larger context? Uh, you know, the <laughs> not not so much nature, nature or natural resources driven, but just the environment itself. And I'm and I'm just kind of hard, I, I, you know, in terms of uh, I don't understand how uh, situations that have been created by either you know uh, by such by such a force as capitalism, it's going to help these people. Well, they're living there because they, they just don't have the money to move elsewhere. So I, and when you come down to it, most people would say no one wants to live there. And in and, and, and that kind of a context there, where there's really, uh, uh, they're kept up, uh, they can't sleep very well at night because of the noise, or because of the traffic. I mean, there are all these variables, it seems to me that, you know, I don't, you know, and they're not natural resources driven. They're they're driven by how the how the environment has been shaped over the years. Yes, and <laughs> you're this is a lifetime body of work, so you're not wrong there. But what I would say is that environmental justice populations, which have been identified in the past as low income minority populations or indigenous peoples disproportionately feel the burdens of pollution in a natural resources way. And so what this, the goal of environmental justice is, is to correct that by also making sure that all communities are um, enjoying the benefits of decisions made by government, especially when it comes to programs or funding. And that's not a goal you reach overnight. That's not a goal you reach in two years. That's not a goal you can attach a timeline to. Where you can start is by developing a policy that provides everybody a shared language. Can I, can I ask one more? <laughs> we need to wrap up. Um, this is the beginning of a conversation. And I, I think actually we're going to, that was great. <clears throat> close for this session. Thank you okay. for coming in today. Thank you. Very helpful. Um, we have a lot of people at ANR that work programmatically with environmental justice and with our legal team around compliance. So um, I just offer that because they they have a mo more thorough expertise than I do. But, um, but I look forward to it. Thank you. For Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for listening to me stumble. I trying to trying to articulate it the best I can, but thank you. Thank you. Thank you.